Okay, welcome everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, just a housekeeping note, you've, you've probably um, heard already, but this session is being recorded. Um, <clears throat> if, if, you'd, if you want to say something, would you rather it's not recorded? We can edit it out later. So uh, send us an email if you prefer that. Um, <clears throat> and thanks to, to Podrig Lyons uh, joining us today. Um, <clears throat> we, some, some of us from, uh, some of us know Pod from Newcastle and Durham days uh, where he was, he did a PhD and was working as a researcher. So it's, it's really nice to have him back um, and speaking to us from industry. Um, <clears throat> so apart from uh, working in research and lecturing and uh, Paul was heavily involved in setting up the first smart grid labs at uh, Siemens Smart Grid Lab at, at Newcastle University. Uh, he also worked for several years at, at TNEI. Um, currently, Paul's working at ESB in, in Dublin, um, but we've, we've just found out, or he, he's just mentioned today to me that he's, he's starting a new job on Monday. Uh, so congratulations, Pod, at the um, International Energy Research Center in Cork. And uh, he's gonna be head of group there. So, so well done, Pod. Um, yeah, so without any further ado, I'll, I'll hand the, the uh, presentation over to you, Pod. Thanks very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks, Chris, for the introduction. So um, at the moment, I work uh, in ESB Networks, which is the, the DSO in Ireland. And I'll probably talk a little bit about what, it, what the DSO is and what the role is here in Ireland with respect to the DSO. And um, so I'll just probably just kick off there. So I give just give an overview here of what I'm going to talk about. So I'm, I li I'm in Ireland. Um, and so ESB is, a, is the utility in Ireland. And so I'm going to talk about First of all, how we're doing in terms of our um, progress towards net zero and decarbonisation um, between what we've achieved so far and what what is emerging from you know what the the, the trends that are happening thus far uh, and what we need to address. And so the the questions for the future then for ESB Networks and for the company that I work for at the moment, um, I talk about the, some of the key initiatives to address these challenges. And then I'll touch on um, our electrification activities, which will be a, a very important part of decarbonizing the heat and transport sectors. And also talk about some of our more, um, uh, more interesting uh, innovation projects where we're working with a variety of stakeholders to, to deliver enhanced distribution system capability and also to, to enable the low carbon transition. Um, so by way of overview, um, this is where Ireland is in the past few years. So th these figures are from the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. And if you look at the, the dark blue, um, the dark blue bars, they represent um, CO2 emissions in uh, megatons um, for uh, 20, 2005, 2010, 2015, and 2018. So these are the latest figures that the Energy Authority of Ireland have generated. And you can see that actually we're doing very well, uh, relatively speaking, in terms of decarbonizing our uh, electricity generation sector. And this is largely due to, to wind. Uh, we have a very high proportion of uh, wind and our, I think as a nation, we have the second highest uh, proportion of wind connected in the world. Um, we're now touching, we're doing trials in collaboration with the TSO to have a, a, a synchronous, uh, a non-synchronous penetration of wind of up to 70% instantaneously. So up to 70% of our, of our load can be handled by non-synchronous uh, generation, which is primarily wind. And that's, that's pretty important here in Ireland because unlike, let's say, countries like Denmark, which is actually the only country that has a higher proportion of wind than us, we're not heavily tied into a, a, a larger grid. We're, we're primarily in a, a, you know, a, an island grid with two interconnects, uh, one over to Wales and one over to Scotland to, um, to Great Britain. So great progress in terms of electricity generation and decarbonisation. 
But if you look at the, the dark green and the dark green one, which is transport, we made some progress in the years down to, to 2010. But then uh, we had quite a downturn in the economy in 2010. We had a, a, a very severe recession here in Ireland and there was a, a downturn in transport emissions. But actually, you can see the, the dark green uh, bar, uh, the megatons of CO2, they're actually beginning to increase. Uh, and have increased as we have increased car ownership and stuff like this. And that's kind of in contrast to the UK, where CO2 emissions due to transport have actually been on the, or have actually been falling. So it looks like we have a lot of work to do there. And, and similarly, um, while we did make some good progress with respect to the uh, CO2 emissions with respect to um, heat, um, between 2015, which is the, the light blue bar, you've seen, you've seen, um, you can see that the, the megatons of CO2 have actually increased. So, you know, these trends are not going in the right direction. And uh, <clears throat> in addition to that, you know, we talk about electricity generation and as we have more um, renewables on the system, um, we're gonna need a lot more flexibility. And, um, you know, flexibility in, the, in, the, in a very high level sense was traditionally provided by bringing um, large scale generation plant on and off. And these were fossil fuel fired. In the future, we're gonna have to look to decarbonize that flexibility. So not only are we decarbonizing generation itself and decarbonizing transport and decarbonizing heat, we also need to consider that we're, we're actually need to decarbonize flexibility. There's not much point putting lots and lots of renewables on the system if the what's balancing the system and what's providing, um, <coughs> excuse me, the the overspill is is provided by diesel gensets or something like that. So demand side response and energy storage are key technologies to achieving um, a decarbonized future. So this is a this graph here is an overview of what the DSO in Ireland is going to look like by 2030. And these figures are based uh, mostly on the climate action plan set out by the, the government here in Ireland. Um, Key thing is just, I suppose, just to give you an idea of who ESB Networks is, is that we're the distribution system operator, and that's a little bit different to the UK. Um, in Ireland, we also uh, own the metering infrastructure, own, operate, and provide revenue data to the market. So in addition to our owning and running the wires type of activity, we also own and manage the, the metering infrastructure of the state. So we're currently in the middle of a, a smart metering program, which the DSO is rolling out. So we'll have 2.3 million smart meters delivered a, by 2030 to every house in the country. And um, we're talking about uh, nearly a million electric vehicles on the road, and um, probably about 12 gigawatts of onshore and offshore generation, uh, grid edge devices, um, maybe three gigawatts of, of energy storage on the system. And a lot of this stuff is going to be happening on the distribution system. Even today, we have about four and a half gigawatts of wind and about three gigawatts of that is located on the distribution system onshore rather than offshore, which is kind of more of the, the model that's used in the UK. But, uh, you know, there is um, big plans here in Ireland to move more of the wind generation capacity offshore. Um, so there, there. That's what we have a vision of by 2030. So lots of challenges for for the electrical power system, and it's worth noting as well that ESB Networks owns the uh, transmission assets as well as the distribution assets, which is again a little bit different to the UK. And ESB Networks is a is a semi state, and it's part of ESB Group. And ESB Group consists of uh, Electric Ireland, which is the retail retail arm, and it owns has about 40 percent of the market. Uh, here at Ireland in terms of retailing of electricity. And there is also a, a generation business and we have about 30% of the market in terms of the generation business. So it's, a, it's um, you know, in terms of customer numbers, ESB Networks is probably smaller than the UK network operators, but, you know, with the addition of the generation business and the retail businesses, it's quite a substantial business here in Ireland. Um, interestingly, in Ireland, and it's probably this is about similar to Scotland, we have uh, huge amounts of overhead lines. Um, our uh, patterns of population are very distributed. Um, we don't have a much of a gas network. Gas networks are mostly confined to urban areas of Cork and Dublin and to a lesser extent Galway. Um, so we don't have a huge gas network. Um, so 
important. If you want to decarbonize heat and transport, electricity is, a, is going to be a big part of the solution in this country. And um, in comparison to other European countries, we have six times the European average of uh, overhead line and uh, cable. So that's per capita. So for every person, uh, there's six times the amount of, of electrical infrastructure per person uh, in comparison with the European average. And that's a combination of our uh, sparse population, our low population, but also the way it's distributed. It's 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 uh, distributed all over the country rather than in, in more denser settlements. Um, so we're a ringfest utility, we're a monopoly here in Ireland. And um, these are very challenging numbers for us if we're going to support uh, from a distribution system operator point of view to pro provide the infrastructure for that. So we need to be looking into the future and looking looking for it to be done in a smart collaborative manner. So what what questions did this raise? Do, do, do these changes raise? So um, how will customers' needs and change requirements change? In the case of, for example, fully electric properties, there will be an increased dependency on the electricity system. You know, what resilience will customers demand of the system? What will uh, new voltage and thermal issues caused by new load generation? You know, will harmonics also need to be considered when we're connecting uh, heat pumps, EVs, etc.? Um, you know, the proliferation of uh, low carbon technology on the system. You know, is that going to have a, a different sort of impact on the assets of the system, and how will it impact on the asset life? Um, it's acknowledged that larger amounts of energy will be flowing through the distribution system and how should ESB networks provide this capability to the distribution system and to the customers? Because at the end of the day, it's all about thinking about the, the utilities, you know, the utility that is provided by electricity and what customers want. So that's where we need to, to think about how we collaborate and how would we collaborate with partners such as suppliers, generators, to ensure that we're designing whole system solutions and not designing solutions that just consider, you know, our, you know, you know, we could design a solution that basically uh, drives down the costs from an ESB networks and a DSO point of view, but actually just simply shoves the cost somewhere else. And actually, from a whole system point of view, it increases the overall costs. Um, and so, how do we do this best? Um, how do we manage the provision of flexibility to the TSO? Yeah, and this is a kind of a question that's asked a lot. You know, if if you're if you're looking for more flexibility from, you know, I touched on it earlier on about uh, demand side response, etc., um, and you're looking for maybe EVs or maybe technologies such as vehicle to grid or um, energy storage to provide that uh, flexibility, if you end up spending then uh, additional um, investment, putting an additional investment in the distribution system to provide those services. Is that providing best value overall to the customers? Because at the end of the day, the customer sees a bill for their energy. And I think that, you know, you talk about the energy trilemma, you're, you need to provide that reliability of supply and you want it green and sustainable, uh, but you want to do it at the least cost possible. And we can only achieve that least cost possible um, by collaborating and understanding the, you know, when we make a decision, where do the other costs go into the system? And um, finally, you know what I, if if you can see that, I think maybe the the thing might be hiding it. But with respect to you know proliferation of things like micro generation, um, proliferation of EVs, proliferation of heat pumps, there's a whole pile of uncertainty as to how these different technologies are are going to um, appear on the system. Um, in contrast to the UK, we're only now thinking of introducing uh, a, an incentive scheme for micro generation for that smaller generation under six kilowatts single phase and 11 kilowatts three phase. So um, we're not really sure how customers are going to engage with that particular incentive and how quickly they're going to uh, take it up. Like in Germany, you know, as probably a lot of you are aware, they had a lot of issues with respect to um, you know, huge uptake in uh, photovoltaics across the system and it posed a number of challenges for system operators um, to, to manage. And, and of course, there's costs. When you have problems, you know, that means costs. And so, you know, you need to be thinking about things, but if you can plan ahead as to where the uh, pinch points on the network are going to appear, 
then it's going to make it easier to plan and then you also minimize the possibility of, of stranding assets but forecasting where uh, evs and heat pumps are going to occur is, is something we probably are not best placed to do on our own and so you know we're looking at the economic and social research institute and the central statistics office to, to support us with that so within esb um I, I pod, sorry to yeah to break your flow um <clears throat> i don't think we can hide that uh, stop sharing notification but i think it's, you might... i think it's only there i think it's only there it's a problem yeah when it's I at don't... the bottom side oh yeah. i can see hide sorry yeah thanks very much Perfect. cheers no thanks thanks chris cheers so um key key initiatives to meet these challenges so we the the smart metering program which is a, a two billion program to put a smart meter into every home in the country um and you know it'll be moving up to, to businesses as we go forward and that'll give us that will give us much better visibility of the distribution system but you know that isn't the driver for it really it's more about um providing customers with the um greater visibility of their bills and and enabling uh them to make better decisions and uh possibly to enable them to more actively participate in the operation of the system if they so wish we have a program of asset health and optimization and so this is bringing together um the data that we have on our assets so that we are able to deliver and enable timely investments in these assets we have our active system management project so this is uh, a project uh, which is, you know, it's it's got elements of the ENA's Open Networks project, and it's about imagining and uh, implementing um, tools and technologies to manage the network in an active way to facilitate the provision of system services and the use of flexibility. Um, we have a very, very active um, uh, demand side um demand side uh, response market already um we have about uh, i think about a gigawatt and a half of demand side response on the system and it, like you know we have a small system in ireland it's uh, five gigawatts is the peak load and we have a, probably about maybe seven gigawatts of installed capacity so the demand side response element to that is actually quite substantial and we have about 800 um customers providing uh, demand response now these are larger customers they're not um, on the on the domestic level but you know th this is happening today and already it's we're beginning to see some challenges that the large scale proliferation of uh, demand response is having in the system we have a, a digital strategy that's aiming to deliver digitally enabled distribution networks and knit the different bits and pieces that we're talking about here in terms of asset health smart metering active system management um you know the ICT infrastructure that will be enable that will enable that will be critical. We have an innovation strategy, which is a suite of innovation targeted innovation projects across three roadmaps, uh, and I'll probably touch on that in a little bit more detail later. And we have an electrification strategy. Um, they're they're key initiatives to meet these challenges, um, and it gets it gets a bit complex because there's lots of crossover and interdependency between all these different initiatives and strategies. So. Um, in the electrification strategy, for example, um, you know, you might be thinking it's just about connecting electric vehicles or heat pumps or, or what have you, but you know, it touches things like smart metering because you know you're, you're, you want to have uh, visibility of uh, where the uh, EVs and heat pumps are emerging, um, and also you know, active system management. You know, if, if uh, electric vehicles and heat pumps are going to enable um, customers to become uh, prosumers or active energy citizens um you know you need as a as a dso to ensure that their activity is not going to negatively impact on the the power quality and the and the supply of other customers who may not win, may maybe not want to engage in the same way so there's huge amounts of crossover between all these strategies and it takes a lot of uh, coordination and thinking to make sure that you know there's no duplication of effort so talking about you know some of the stuff that we're, we're considering is our electrification strategy um and this will actually be published um tomorrow uh that's the plan um and you know we have we probably began this journey about six months ago um lots of stakeholder engagement across the piece we had a lot of webinars and stakeholder events which we had to do obviously online because of the the current COVID situation 
Um, bilateral meetings with key stakeholders like the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland, um, uh, you know, city and county councils who will be providing public EV charging infrastructure. Um, the departments, uh, the regulator, uh, EV owners themselves, uh, charge point operators. So there's lots and lots of people to consider when you're, you know, what what seems like a thing like connecting EVs. It's it sounds kind of e, you know, in some ways it sounds kind of easy, um, but you know, there's a whole pile of stakeholders and people you have to think about when you're when you're designing these strategies. So our the vision is that we'll facilitate our customers to connect at least a million electric vehicles and at least 600,000 heat pumps. And that, that's probably up on what I presented earlier because um, we expect that the targets for EVs and heat pumps in Ireland are going to increase um, in line with the more ambitious targets that have been set out by government in the past year or so so you know we have more ambitious targets to decarbonize i think to seven percent per year um by 2030 um in our newest government uh we have a uh, uh, two main parties Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, and also we have the green party so they've influenced quite substantially the agenda that we're going to have going to, to 2030. um our strategy our objectives our strategy our clear information and guidance in relation to the connection of electric vehicles and heat pumps. We're going to collaborate with our customers to ensure whole system approaches. You know, we're, we don't want to sit in a silo and just think of our own uh, little world and reducing our own costs for our own benefit. And, you know, we're lucky in a way, as we're a semi-state, that, you know, we can have that little bit of latitude to consider the entire system rather than maybe just delivering uh, value for one set of stakeholders. Ensure that the capability of the distribution system is expanded in a cost-effective manner. Uh, leverage the possibilities afforded, offered by new innovative technologies and smart solutions. We want to develop solutions that are scalable, that'll be flexible enough to quickly uh, provide capabilities to the distribution system. And that's important because, um, you know, the, the when and the where and the how of electric vehicles in this country or in indeed any country it's not quite known you know there will be things like advances in technologies for example solid state batteries there will be advances in manufacturing capability and we're already beginning to see the price of electric vehicles begin to drop down and i think i think just bloomberg new energy finance expect that there will be cost parity uh, between electric vehicles and internal combustion vehicles by 2023 2024 so it's it's very very close to a, a tipping point um, but at the same time, we need to be cognizant as the DSO that we don't start investing in infrastructure before it's required. Infrastructure, and what I mean by infrastructure, that's not just, you know, copper cable in the ground or aluminium cable in the ground, but also, you know, what smart solutions we need to deploy. And that kind of chimes with um, delivering that additional capability of the distribution system in a timely manner. We don't want to be holding anything up. So we need to get that capability in the system and smart solutions are part of that story and you know stick with you know what we've always done which is ensure that the security and reliability of the distribution is maintained and enhanced and then consider the broader potential impacts that any changes required to enable electrification may have on vulnerable customers um so to enable these objectives we have a few key uh um teams and so removing policy barriers is about removing both you know improving documentation um removing um you know if there's any unforeseen blockers to uh customers connecting evs or um heat pumps or maybe city and county councils installing ev charge points we need to get ahead of those and and start to engage with them to understand if there's any barriers on our side but also support um policy um at a governmental and uh local authority level uh, and, you know, with authorities such as the uh, National Standards Authority here in Ireland and, and Safe Electric who maintain our wiring regulations. We're going to look to engage, enable and empower our customers to electrify. Uh, and so th what that means is that, you know, we're, we're going to, as an organization, um, engage with customers, understand what they need, understand what they're going to want, um, what challenges they have uh, with respect to uh, electrified heat and transport and uh, look to remove the barriers associated with that. And finally, which is, a you know, for the, for the tech people, it's ensuring network readiness. And actually, I have just a slide here, which is kind of sums up what our approach to ensuring network readiness is about. Um, 
Some of you may remember that we had a, a nice acronym before when I was working in Newcastle and Durham called VEG. And this is my new VEG. So it's called FIMS. So it's called Forecast, Identify, Monitor, Smart Solutions and Strengthen the Network. And so this is how we ensure network readiness. Um, we will you know, forecast um, and develop forecasting tools. Uh, in collaboration with partners such as universities, uh, the Central Statistics Office, uh, the Economic and Social Research Institute, uh, different organizations like that, so that we can identify, you know, what are the long term um, trends in uh, electrification of heat and transport EVs and heat pumps, um, and also work to identify where clusters of these uh, technologies are going to emerge and that will be that'll be critical because that'll feed into the next stage, which is identify. Um, you know, knowing where the heat and transport um, needs are going to occur, uh, and looking at you know the areas of our network which may be uh, already approaching uh, overloading. Mapping those together will allow us to identify which uh, items of infrastructure on this system. Will will need may need to be um, to be reinforced or provide additional capability with true smart solutions, and um, you know as a prudent system operator, we need to ensure that you know we we we've, we've used forecasting, uh, we've looked at our own infrastructure, we've looked at the our own loading on the system. We will then monitor um, those areas of the network to confirm that you know that the additional capability and the distribution system is required. OK, so that will feed back into the forecast, of course, and also feed back into the identification phase. And then, you know, we we'll first look at smart solutions. Um, you know, there's a direction of travel um, on a European level that, you know, we need to look at flexibility and look at new solutions to provide additional capability in the system. And in many cases, smart solutions are, are a really good option because it, particularly in urban areas, um, you know, digging up. Uh, roads and other areas, um, or buying sites to provide uh, additional transformers and stuff is 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 really really tough work and really difficult and relies needs a lot of stakeholder engagement, and so smart solutions will provide additional capability to the system in certain locations um, to um, alleviate any constraints that we see on the system, and finally when we you know where smart solutions are either not cost effective or they're not feasible we look to actually strengthen the network so that you know we don't want to be an impediment to customers adopting uh, electrified heat and transport and you know that will feed back into the into the the forecast and identification um phases of the the strategy again so that's that's the fims um with respect to forecasting and analytics um i think this this graph here uh, gives, um, if you can see my cursor, this is kind of just illustrating uh, for people who may not be electrically minded, you know, what, what's the impact of uh, EVs and heat pumps on the system. So, you know, the fundamental thing is that this blue line represents the voltage profile of today. Um, as we add additional heat pumps and EVs onto the system, um, this voltage profile under peak low conditions during the winter peak begins to drop further down. And while it's fine for much of the network, customers at the very end of the network, which is down around here, you know, they may experience voltages that go below the statutory limits. And that's bad news for equipment uh, or for people's comfort if they have an EV or a, a heat pump connected at that end. So, you know, that's exactly the kind of situation we want to avoid. And that's why we need to provide additional capability to the system to avoid the situation. In addition to voltage problems, you know, you, you'll also see where my cursor here is, is circling. You know, you may find that there is too much load passing through the, the local MV LV transformer or even through cables up here. So what we have done for a new build is that we've changed our standard uh, for designing networks and we've moved that from a, a 2.5 kilowatt ADMD, which is like a, a proxy for an average demand per customer, up to 5.5. And so that 5.5 is based on data from uh, and uh, information from academia, uh, our own research here in Ireland, but also research from um, projects like customer-led network revolution, et cetera. And so we're, we're collaborating uh, in the future to, 
with SEI, CSO and these different organizations to, to do that forecasting work. And we're investigating the use also of using smart meter data to, to enable the programming. So there's a lot of uh, startups out there that are looking at, you know, leveraging the power of smart metering data. And we're in a privileged police position here in Ireland that uh, we are the people operating the smart meter. So it does make it a little bit easier to access that data to improve the operation of the system and to deliver, um, uh, you know, to deliver uh, a network that is enabling uh, electrified heat and transport at, at a most cost-effective manner possible. And this um, was the new LV design. Um, again, um, informed by the research trials and pilots that we've done before and uh, those done in other jurisdictions. Um, you know, again, it probably chimes back to this uncertainty thing. I'm not sure if the graph is brilliant, but you know, depending on how it happens, you know, the, the average low per customer might end up somewhere like here or it might end up somewhere like here. You know, there's people out there who are, um, who are, you know, having two electric vehicles in their homes rather than one. Maybe this will become the norm or, you know, public transport will become much more pervasive. So there's a lot of uncertainty. So what we've done is that we've just said, okay, we're going to put an additional capability into our LV designs. It's going to actually cost us very little. So the, the risk of doing that is very small. So we're looking, uh, we're collaborating with UCD uh, on a uh, real options analysis of, of this approach to demonstrate that, you know, uh, how, you, um, how you determine investments, investment decisions in um, conditions of, of a lot of uncertainty. So I'm now going to just quickly press on with the uh, our innovation stuff. So I left e I left uh, Newcastle in 2016, and uh, one of the first things that I was involved in was our innovation strategy. So it was our first innovation strategy for ESP networks, and this was launched in September 2017. Um, since then, we've uh, done a lot of stakeholder engagement. We started off with eight roadmaps. We're down to three roadmaps now. Uh, we consult on this uh, strategy every year, looking for feedback on you know how we're doing, and uh, we run a lot of innovation forums. Um, we have a, a num we've thirty projects across three roadmaps right now. So our three roadmaps are future customer, which is about import empowering and supporting customers to actively engage with the energy system. So climate action is about decarbonizing electricity generation, heat and transport, which times some of the stuff we were talking about earlier, and then network resilience. So that's efficient, secure, and reliable. Uh, electricity and um, just probably just going to highlight some of our um, key projects so um, our biggest project that we're doing is the Dingle electrification project it's our flagship project to understand the impact of electrification prosumers and their relationship with the DSO it builds on the previous research that we've done um, what we've done is that we've done a, for example, we're trialing new systems to provide additional LV visibility. We've done a huge amount of engagement with uh, customers in Dingle. So Dingle is a, you know, it's it's at the very west coast of Ireland, and it's actually quite a tricky network to manage. It's it's actually the most westerly point in Europe. So you can imagine how right now it's a very nice place and it's very beautiful, but um, it does present some challenges in delivering uh, low carbon energy. Um, but as part of the project, uh, we're running a, an EV trial with uh, 20 customers uh, trialing EVs for a period. We're deploying vehicle to grid chargers down there. Um, there's... Uh, photovoltaics there's heat pumps being deployed there and you know we're looking at how they all work together um in these kind of locations to, to deliver a low carbon transition and and it's very relevant because is like ireland is is quite a rural country if you if you take dublin out of it and to an extent cork um well over 60 percent of the population live in rural areas so it's it's a very important part of our decarbonization story um what else uh, we're doing there is also where we've been looking at peer-to-peer uh, -peer concepts and uh, looking to, to trial a peer-to-peer -peer concept down there. Now, we did have a expressions of interest for that uh, in, a, in a trial that we, you know, we were carried out earlier on the year, but we didn't receive uh, any substantial responses to that. So what that told us is that 
uh, the peer-to-peer uh, market is still quite nascent and uh, probably needs to develop a bit more. And so the project will seek to understand and empower and understand the role of active energy citizens or prosumers uh, in, a, in a future network. Um, a project probably that's closer to me is the uh, a positive city exchange project. So this is a Horizon 2020 project. So this uh, Limerick was the first city in Ireland uh, to be awarded lighthouse city status. And I think in the UK, probably Manchester is, has got this as part of the Triangulum project, which is a couple of years old now. And uh, the project consists of, of three uh, main uh, elements. Uh, and it's underpinning the, this key concept of the positive energy district or the positive energy block. So a positive energy district or a positive energy block is a, an area of an urban area, which actually generates more electricity than what it consumes. And um, that's actually a really, really challenging thing to do in an existing urban area. Um, the the teams or the um, the work the, the primary work streams within the project is um, prototyping the future. So what we we have we're working with a, a, a company called uh, IES. Um, they're they're based both in Ireland and the UK. And what they do is they do a lot of um, urban planning. Um, they can do 3D maps of um, the cityscape uh, and particularly with a view to energy. So, you know, using um, meter data, using uh, energy ratings of buildings, etc. <coughs> they can understand where the big energy users in terms of buildings in the built environment are, are appearing and, you know, where the savings can be made. And uh, Integrating with that is, you know, they're also looking at uh, transport, integrating transport models and also developing an interest, uh, you know, integrating into this overall energy model, uh, a model of the electrical infrastructure as well. So the transport, uh, building, uh, electrical and gas networks, you know, they'll all appear in this in this one model. And the idea of this is to enable better planning for um, local authorities, etc. And one of the key uh, innovations as part of this project is a common energy market. And so again, we're looking here at integrating lots of, you know, if you if you want to have a positive energy block, you need lots and lots of renewable energy embedded within that block. And uh, you know, and part of that then is to, you know, what are you going to do with that energy, and how are you going to consume it locally? And so peer-to-peer -peer energy trading, uh, enabled by things like blockchain and community grids. Is, is what's being trialed. So a company called Empower are developing the platform and are doing the thinking regarding that and ESB networks play a part in ensuring that um, whatever uh, concept that they come up with, you know, that it's it's feasible and it's actually got value, you know, within the organization ourselves, you know, there's, there's a lot of skepticism with respect to peer-to-peer -peer as to, you know, are you actually generating value for the overall energy system or are you just simply shifting um the costs from one set of users to another and that's something that we're very much aware of because you know we have 2.3 million customers and we're very aware that you know a lot of these may not be financially well off and um, may not be able to take part in these kind of schemes so it's, it's it's something that we're very cognizant of and finally um the third part of it is is the community exchange and so it's it's all about uh having an innovation playground um, and positive energy champions and doing all that engagement stuff that will enable, you know, concepts like the community grid, um, large scale integration of renewables to actually work because at the end of the day, people have to live in these environments. It's a smart city project, not an energy project. It's, it's a smart city project with an energy element. So that's a, a real important part of the project. And um, it's a consortium of 32 partners from Limerick City and Council, City and County Council, uh, from 11 countries. Um, so the other partner, Lighthouse City, is Trondheim in Norway. So they're they're pursuing similar approaches, um, and they're looking at similar things, but obviously with a, a Norwegian slant to it rather than an Irish slant to it. Um, and just with the next slide here is this is the area of Limerick where the, the trial will be carried out. And actually the center of Limerick is, if you look, it's it's actually laid out in a, a grid. And that's, uh, it's it's the Georgian era. So a lot of these houses, a lot of these buildings are actually very, very old. So it's actually very, very challenging for them to 
bring their energy rating down and also to integrate renewables. So that's part of the challenge of the project. You know, how do you decarbonize these historic urban areas um, without um, taking away from the essential character and, and the value in terms of histor historicism from these regions? So that's a, and it's, it's right beside it, the river. So one of the, the energy sources that we're considering is is tidal turbines. So um, that will be a, an interesting technology that's being integrated into the system. Finally, I'm going to talk about quickly about React. It's another Horizon 2020 project with 23 projects, uh, three lead demonstration islands. So this is all about decarbonizing islands. So we talked about decarbonizing rural areas of Ireland with Dingle, talk about decarbonizing urban areas in um, Limerick, and this is decarbonizing islands. And we have a lot of islands in Ireland. So Inishmore is the one that's been targeted for this um, here in Ireland. Um, there'll be an ICT platform developed to enable DSR uh, and engage with the existing RES, renewable energy systems and existing EV fleet. And we'll be looking at local microgrids. So that's what we'll be doing with our partners on these projects, looking at local microgrids and how they will be considered for testing different implicit and explicit DSR strategies. So finishing up, there's different challenges in Ireland, raising specific questions with respect to development of our assets. We have a number of interdependent strategies to address these key challenges. So, you know, the electric electrification strategy, the active system management project, our smart meter strategy, they're all interlinked. So managing these even internally within ESB networks is quite a challenge. We're looking to co-innovate. We're not, we recognize that we can't do this on our own. And, um, you know, it's not all about investing in the assets uh, and putting more copper in the ground. You know, there, you know, with especially I believe personally that with the advent of electric vehicles, there's going to be a lot of um, potential for customers to engage with the energy system. You know, I think some of you would have been um, in CLNR. We looked at, you know, tariffs and stuff to look at, you know, moving customer, changing customer behavior with tariffs, particularly during that four to eight o'clock period. Um, and actually, you know, tariffs weren't very effective because, you know, the kind of activity that people use their electricity for during these periods is not very flexible. You know, you're not going to make your dinner at nine o'clock at night because there's a tariff on it. You're still going to come home and make your dinner. Now, of course, COVID is making things a little bit different and it's not something we would have thought about at the time, but in general, that's it. But EVs, I believe that there's huge potential there to provide new services to the system. And I'll finish. ESB networks, we're going to engage with customers, industry, academia to deliver the optimal mix of solutions. So that's new conventional assets and also smart assets to develop a cost-effective resilient distribution system that enables a low carbon transition and delivers our objective of net zero by 2050. All right, thank you very much. Any questions? Thanks very much, Pod. <clears throat> uh, there was certainly a ton of information in your talk and that's that's been really interesting and it it kind of illustrates the um <clears throat> co complexity of of managing um energy systems or, or or managing them in the future uh so <clears throat> yeah thanks that was um that was really great thanks bod um <clears throat> I, i've got a couple of questions i'll start and then i'll open it up uh we don't have too much time left um do you, um, you might not have got to the stage yet, but do you have any uh, sort of feel for how willing EV customers would be for um, uh, V to G, for, for using their batteries to go back into the grid? Do you have any feel for that at the moment or is that uh, something to... That, that you well, it's, and this is kind of off my own bash as such, but I believe not now, no, because... <laughs> Um, I think the costs associated with the solution to provide V2G is is far too high. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, if 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 you need a dedicated, um, you know, basically like a DC charge point to achieve that. But my understanding is that let's say uh, Tesla, for example, right? Mm -hmm. The power electronics on a Tesla for the AC charging capability, it actually with a with a firmware upgrade, you can actually do bidirectional. Okay. So all of a That's sudden, built in. Yeah. It's a, so it's in, so you could your your charger that you can buy for five hundred quid today or seven hundred quid today could be V to G. 
at the moment you're looking at a set of bespoke power electronics to hook up to the DC port of a of an EV like a Leaf, and then provide the V2G capability that way. But if you have the vehicle itself with a bi-directional charger, well, it's it's much easier and much yeah. more cost effective. So that's I think that would be a very that that would be a game changer in terms of V2G. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the provision of service from V2G, but I believe smart charging has a will have a huge role to play as well. You know, if if you're charging at seven kilowatts and you drop that down to zero, you know that's the same thing as adding seven kilowatts of generation. Yeah. So so th that's the first stage, and I think unlocking that will be really important. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, I, I wondered if you wanted to say a bit about your your new job. What, what uh, so the we so the International Energy Research Center is embedded with an institute called the Tyndall Institute in University College Cork, oh, yeah. and uh, that is so they they they're a group that's going on a good few years. They're going through a bit of a restructuring, but they look at lots of different aspects of energy. There's about I think there's about maybe nineteen or twenty people there, and at the moment they're split into five groups. Uh, buildings, um, ICT, um, electrical and power systems, um, policy, uh, particularly uh, policy, and uh, then there was another one about the built environment. So there are five different groups uh, there. So um, we're we'll be looking to the future of. Um, Currently, they get a certain amount of support from government directly, um, and they're looking to supplant that with, you know, additional revenue from uh, Science Foundation Ireland, which is basically like our EPSRC, um, and looking to Horizon 2020 and and building out the group uh, in the future. Um, and we're, you know, yesterday actually we had a, a very funny meeting. We had a, a meeting between ESB Networks and IERC. So that was a, an interesting meeting for me, you know. <laughs> yeah. So it, it should be good. It should be good. Yeah. Well, good. Good luck with that, and uh, well done on getting that position. Um, I, I want to open out the questions now. I think there's a couple of things in the chat. Uh, feel free to use the chat or raise your hand if you want to. If you want to ask Paul a question. Um, okay, Matt's asking. Can you tell us a bit more about the decarbonisation of heat in Ireland? Um, do, do you know what the current current fuel mix um, for meeting heat demand? So, so um, we're um, if I. At the moment, right in double in in urban areas, heat pumps are used in fifty percent of the new builds in Ireland. So you have two options: you've gas or heat pumps, and fifty percent of them are heat pumps right now. We have a lot of one ho one off housing in the rural areas, and I think they are more like eighty percent of new builds are are heat pump driven. So we're in terms of the new build, yeah, we're we're flying with the heat pumps. No retrofitting is going to be is going to be a, a real challenge and i'd say it's probably similar in the uk um and lots of our housing stock is is either old or of very poor quality so um you know getting new technologies to enable that retrofit to enable technologies like heat pumps is going to be really important but you know um it's 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 an interesting one because there is technologies out there. You know, I think some of the things that maybe some people have pointed to in the UK, particularly, is hybrid heat pumps, which use gas to top up the capability of the heat pump, and also you know high power heat pumps where you have a two stage heat pump, one one that heats the the water up to maybe fifty degrees, and then another stage that takes it up to sixty seventy degrees. Because the problem with um, you know older buildings, you need a huge amount of heat, but actually getting that heat into the building is a problem. And how you how we would have traditionally done that, even though we didn't even realize that we were doing it, was that we were actually turning up the temperature of the water so that you know you can get enough heat into the house to keep it warm and and deal with the loss of heat that's 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 happening due to uh, poor insulation and drafts, etc. Um so the 5.5 is there, it's the 5.5 is actually aligned with um 
you know, ENA's figures and Northern Power Grid's figures for, you know, what you might extrapolate that will be the combined load of an EV and heat pump together uh, under over peak conditions. No, um, it, it won't work everywhere, but um, it, 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 will, it should work in a lot of places. And this is for new build. When we're going back into existing uh, existing network, you know, we'll probably take it on a case by case base and try and be a little bit more refined. Um, you, you know, that we have people who do the designs on the low voltage network in throughout the country, and you know, they fair, need fairly simple um, metrics to design the network. Now, have, I'm not sure if I've answered that question correctly. Is if Matt would like to say, is am I answering the question correctly? Oh yeah. So the the increase is due to EV and heat together. Cool. So, yeah, no, that's perfect. I mean, I was I was just slightly curious if the heating demand at the moment is mostly met as sort of resistive heating and putting a heat pump in might reduce the peak demand for what existing housing stock there is, which is kind of the last. Yeah. Point, well, we do we do have we do have some customers on resistive heating, and we probably wouldn't do anything with that. We have a different calculation for resistive heating. Right. So enough. so what you do, yeah, you do, we, we diff, it's a different calculation and I'm not sure how much of it is based in science, but we definitely have a different calculation. <laughs> um, but the 5.5 5 is, is like that, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Ford. Uh, I've got a question from David Greenwood. Um, he says smart meter rollout, which is um, led by the suppliers in the UK is controversial and unpopular. Um, how how popular do you think smart meters are with with customers in Ireland? Um, I would being, say uh, actually there's no negative feedback. Um, in con probably a little bit in contrast to the suppliers, um, ESB is a very very trusted organisation. Mm. Very very trusted. Like you know, <laughs> I, I'm probably saying this kind of off the cuff, like but. You know, there was a national broadband plan there, so rural broadband. And, uh, you know, who was going to deliver this? And there was a lot of controversy over here. It's about a 3.5 billion euro project. And, you know, most people just say, oh, just get the ESP to do it. <laughs> like any problem in the state, you know, just get the ESP to do it. You know, because we, we're such a, a good, strong brand that, you know, people are, yeah. are very trust, mm. trusting towards us. So the the rollout is, is is so far so good. Probably the main criticism you could have of it is, you know, the first Smiths one uh, smart meters went out in the UK probably starting out in 2011. We started our rollout nine years later, so we're we're a long way behind. Mm. But um, all the meter so, but it's 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 much simpler in Ireland because, you know, every single meter in Ireland would be coming back to the same head end. Yeah. So. You know, we, we and then we report that back to the market, and that goes to the single electricity market. So it's 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 actually much much simpler. So it's it's more cost effective and probably delivers better value to customers. And that's what you're trying to do. You know, uh, where markets work is you know where you need competition to drive out the efficiencies. But sometimes you know, in the case of smart meters, it does look like having uh, you know a monopoly such as ESP networks rolling. You know, it does seem it does seem to be better. And it puts us in a very strong position to leverage the benefits of it. You know, that you know, a lot of the benefits of smart meters are, you know, new tariffs, uh, flexible tariffs, dynamic tariffs, uh, enabling the prosumer, all that kind of stuff. And that's all good stuff. But it also, you know, it, it also allows uh, us to basically have much more visibility of what's going on at the low voltage level. It's acknowledged that the the uh, the uptake of EVs, heat pumps, micro generation, uh, domestic energy storage, the impacts of those are going to be first felt on the low voltage network. And in any jurisdiction, the low voltage network is the one that we have the least visibility on. So, you know, there's a lot of benefits from that point of view that could be leveraged from, from using that meter data. Now, GDPR, interestingly, means that uh, we actually don't have an automatic right to the data that's coming off the smart meters to do uh, network analysis. You know, it has to, you know, it has to, we have to go through that process because the reason the consent that customers gave to install a smart meter was for revenue collection. So that's just a, a little bit of a hurdle that needs to be got through. But you know, there is there is there is something there. Um 
had one other point to make it with that. No, no, that's 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 fine. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, Marcus has a question. Is it uh, Chris? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Any concerns so are there any about decarbonization of electricity and system stability? Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a great question actually, um, because from a TSO TSO level, we're very very slowly moving up the SNSPs. So we moved from 65%. So that's the, I can never remember what SNSP stands for, but it's non-synchronous penetration, system non-synchronous penetration. And so we were at 65% uh, uh, and we're moving, we're testing at 70 now. And, you know, supporting that is the, the what's known as the TSO's DS3 program. And uh, what supports that is new services. We have fast frequency response. Uh, David Greenwood will be very familiar with that. Um, pr uh, primary operating reserve. Although, and we have a, a raft of uh, frequency services that move down through the system. You know, and you know, a lot of people when they talk about um, stability, they talk about t very much frequency stability. Um, you know, we have we don't get much flex. We don't get much support from the the micro from the interconnects for stability and um, they're small providers of, of support because the primary provider of support is the the synchronous machines what we've done also is that just like uh, national grid uk we've opened up the rate of change of frequency so we're one hertz per second now for the rock off as it's known um, a lot of older inverter coupled generators would have used rock off as a, an islanding detection or a loss of mains uh, protection approach. Um, so that was a challenge to ensure that, particularly the larger generators, that as many of those were switched to a one hertz per second uh, or higher rock off as against the you know 0.5, which would have been set before. Because what would happen in the event of a frequency event where you were allowing one hertz per second, um, all those devices would trip off. They would no longer be providing generation and you would be actually exacerbating uh, an already uh, difficult frequency event. Yeah. So frequency is, is, a, is an issue. And of course, the other uh, challenge is as you remove um, fossil fuel based synchronous generators for the system, it does have an impact on fall currents uh, because uh, inverter coupled generators provide typically one to 1 1.5 times their ratings in terms of fall current, whereas a synchronous machine could provide up to six times uh, and more transiently. So um, that's that's a, another, there's another fleet of products associated with that. But, you know, we're looking to get up to maybe 90 or 95% SNSP by, by 2030 to get the kind of levels of generation on the system that, you know, 12 gigawatts on the system when you're probably going to have maybe six or seven gigawatts peak. Now, we are expecting additional uh, data centers to arrive and there will be a additional load due to EVs and heat pumps. But I would think that myself is that you'll need all hands on deck in terms of flexibility. You'll definitely have to have a strong conversation with generators with respect to, um, you know, um, curtailing generation is going to be just a fact of life in the future. You know, we, we I think the generators, the wind generators in Ireland are priority, have been priority dispatch. Uh, and they are not priority dispatch anymore, but because they usually trade at the you know almost zero for for their generation, you know they always get to top of the the merit order. Um, but um, you're you're going to have to have a situation come 2030, uh, and you, as you move forward even more, that you know these guys are going to just have to be curtailed. You know they you know they're not going to get paid for every single kilowatt hour that they're going to generate. So they need to make their money from different different mechanisms. So the kilowatt hour, I think, is going to be, uh, you know, looked at. Uh, I think it's going to become much, much less important. And actually, uh, capacity and ancillary services are going to form a much bigger part of the revenue streams for generators. And, you know, in a way, it'll probably be, the kilowatt hour is probably going to become less of a factor in terms of of trading on, on wholesale energy markets. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. Okay, I'm I'm aware. Unfortunately, we've run slightly over, but uh, that's been a really interesting talk and uh, really good uh, question. Uh, sorry, 
really good points arising out of the questions. So I um, really appreciate that, Pod. Okay, it was great talking to you all, yeah? Yeah, and it's nice to, to have you back. Um, yep, virtually. For a, little, for a little visit, yeah. <laughs> virtually. Um, just, uh, just to let everyone know, in two weeks' time, we've, we've got another, um, uh, I think, is this from industry? We've got uh, Dr. Nicole Miranda, and she'll be talking about the future of cooling and its links to sustainable development goals. Uh, so I think that will be really interesting. Uh, so look out for that in two weeks and uh, hope to see you there. Um, yeah, so again, thanks very much, Cord. Uh, it's really good to, to have you uh, chatting to us about all, all manner of things um, energy related. That's, that's been really interesting. Um, and thanks to everyone who's, who's joined and asked questions. Um, and uh, we'll hopefully see you in a couple of weeks. Uh, yeah, and some messages of good luck in your new job, Pod. Um, All right, thanks a million, guys. Yeah, well, well done for that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We'll so. See you soon. Yeah. I'll end. I'll end it here. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks. thanks Bye Pod. now. Cheerio. Bye bye.